Hello, I'm Tracy Holmes. He was a Wisden cricketer of the century and in 2004 was the leading cricketer in the world. He was without doubt one of the world's greatest ever bowlers. A star of the Australian cricket team, a captain of his state. If Brilliant described his life on the cricket pitch, his life off it could only be described as colourful. Shane Warne's passing at the age of 52 has shocked the sporting world, but this larger-than-life character will live on, remembered as perhaps one of sport's true great characters, an open book from an era when athletes could be people instead of only brands. Recently, I sat down in conversation with Shane Warne as a guest of the Chapel Foundation, raising funds for youth homelessness. He will forever be remembered for the ball of the century when he bowled Mike Gatting with his first ball in his Ashes debut. And I started by asking Shane if he talks to Gatting about that delivery. You missed the straight one. That, um, <laughs> that's basically about it, really. But uh, just the first ball in my Ashes series, it was... Um, it was pretty special. I remember sitting on the plane with uh, Merv Hughes um, on the plane and I said to him, what's an Ashes series actually like? I remember as a kid growing up and watching the Chapel Brothers in Australia versus England and it was always something special. And I was expecting these wonderful answer, this spine tingling stuff from Merv. And he said, uh, put it this way, England are shit. Um, we're sponsored by a beer company and there's rest day, so it's a great tour. <laughs> and I said, uh, so that should be a pretty good series. But so we, get to, so we get to England, we land, we do all that sort of stuff and um, we get to the first tour game which was against Worcestershire and there's a guy called Graham Hick who was playing and Alan Border pulled me aside and he said, um, look they've got this guy called Graham Hick who's a terrific player, um, he's going to be playing a big part in the Ashes series so make sure that you don't bowl anything to him, just leg breaks, don't bowl anything else, no flippers or wrong ones or anything like that, just leg breaks and I sort of said well should be looking good enough anyway. But um, he made 206, hit 13 sixes off my bowling, and uh, my tour was off to a wonderful start. <laughs> we get to the first test match, I managed to get a selected into the side. Um, the toss goes up on the first day, and England win the toss and take that aggressive move to bowl first again. Uh, <laughs> Mark Taylor makes a good hundred. Um, we uh, overnight we're about six for 230 or 240. Mark Taylor made a great hundred. So the next day I thought, well, I'm going to bat for the first time in an Ashes series. Then I'm going to have to bowl later in the day. So let's have a you know a nice early night. Um, so Merv grabbed me and said, look, I know it's a big day for you tomorrow. Let's just have a couple of beers at the bar. <laughs> so about two or three o'clock, <laughs> I was uh, after smoking like a green log. Had a couple. I managed to get to sleep for the big day the next day, my first ever Ashes day. I, I, I get to the ground, a wicket falls, I go out to bat, I run Craig McDermott out second ball. <laughs> we lose a couple of wickets, end of the innings. We go out to bowl and Mike Atherton and, and Graham Gooch got off to a great start and just before the lunch break, Alan Border said to me, next over that end. So I went, shit, okay. So I start to loosen up, Merv Hughes knocks over Mike Atherton, Gadding comes out. So we have the lunch break. I'm sitting in the lunchroom and I'm thinking, God, I'm going to have to bowl after lunch. <laughs> Dickie Bird, the umpires knock on the door, come on, we're on the way. We go out there, Alan Border says, rightio, you're up, straight away. Shit, rightio. So I mark my run up out. I look down there, Mike Gatting's on strike. I look at my field, it's pretty good. Graham Gooch is at the non-strikers end. He's just staring at me the whole time. And I sort of just get a bit awkward. So I tell him in Australia, hello. Um, <laughs> I look down, ready at the top of my mark, Dickie Bird says play, stand there, take a breath, Merv, I've got my mate Merv here at mid-off, I take a step, and next moment I hear this, tss, tss, tss. I said what? He said bowl one of those flipper things first up, they won't be expecting that. <laughs> take another step, tss, tss. what? <laughs> wrongen, wrongen, wrongen. <laughs> I said mate, I can knock you over wrongen, but no one else, just, show, just <laughs> relax. Alan Borders at short cover. He says, is there any danger? I said, sorry, Skip, I'm just a little bit nervous. He said, well, hurry up, get on with it. <sighs> Take a step, sure enough, Merv. <sharp inhale> Bowl one of those big turning leg breaks. <laughs> I said, mate, I just want to land it. I just want to land it. He said, <sighs> Take a step, I'm away. Bowl the ball, comes down, curves a little bit in the air. Mike Gatting sort of follows the drift. If it had been food, he wouldn't have missed it, but he misses it. <laughs> 
Hits the top of off stump. Ian Healy was down here somewhere, a leg side, so luckily it hit the stumps. <laughs> and that my first ball, I've just knocked over Mike Gatting with his pretty good leg break. We all run in, Merv comes in, sticks his tongue in the mirror and said, told you, told you, one of those big leg breaks. <laughs> Thanks, Merv. So the, I finished the over. Now at the end of the over, I was just starting to get my jumper, I got my cap off Dickie Bird, and I start to walk down to fine leg. Now about halfway down, I'm starting to resemble David Hasselhoff from Baywatch. <laughs> As I get a little bit closer to the boundary, I'm starting to look like Pamela Anderson, I'm that pump with the ball I've just bowled. And as I get to the boundary, there's some guy at the back of the, the stands just says, hey, warn you, prick. I paid 50 quid to watch Mike getting bat. And that was my first ball in England, so it was, an, uh, it was a good way to start it. Yeah. I know that, you know, you've been so popular in the media over so many years, not just in your playing days, but beyond. And popular? <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> We're trying to impress the crowd. Right, okay, yes, popular is a good word. <laughs> but we heard the three guys up here from Backtrack a little earlier talking about, you know, that, that one person that comes into your life and, and changes the path that you're on. When you were a kid, and you talk about watching the Ashes series when you were a kid and, and just being impressed and, and, you know, it was bigger and greater and mm. absolutely awesome, was there one person or two people in your life that... that showed you a door that you can either walk through this or you can go the other way, it's up to you, and it changed your life? Um, I had many, uh, I suppose, forks in the road or crossroads in my life. Um, my father and my family were always, my, my father's sort of my hero. You know, he was the one that always sort of guided my mum and my family always um, terrific in their upbringing. They supported us. You know, we think back to all, the, all of us that played sport or, even as a kid, the, the time that you spend, and now as a parent, I know how long those, uh, the netball runs or the football runs or the cricket, the school runs and all those types of things on weekends, you give up as a parent. Um, so to my parents, I suppose, were the biggest influence on me um, from that sort of, um, those, that growing up as a kid. But as you get older and you start to play a different, you know, you start to get a little bit better at different sports and you've got to make a decision whether it's football or cricket, in my case, I always wanted to be an AFL footballer, um, but I just wasn't good enough. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not disrespecting cricket in any way, I, but cricket sort of found me. And I developed a passion for it. I was lucky enough that people took uh, an interest in me, um, you know, ranging from Ian Chappell, who I met when I was at the academy, to guys like Terry Jenner, um, Rod Marsh. There was a lot of guys that really helped me through that, my career at the start. And probably Terry Jenner was the biggest impact on my leg spin bowling. And Ian Chappell was probably, I learnt the most of, about the game of cricket, um, speaking to him. But Terry Jenner, I suppose, taught me, I knew how to bowl a leg break, I knew how to bowl a wrong and I knew how to bowl a flipper. But I spent hours and hours in Adelaide at the academy learning what, when and why, what to bowl, when to bowl it and why do you bowl it. And understanding the art of leg spin and how to set batsmen up and have a plan. And Terry introduced me to that style of thinking. Uh, and then for me, I, I, I learned a lot myself um, in combination with a lot of different people I spoke to. But I suppose just on my pure leg spin bowling, I think Terry Jenner probably had the biggest influence on my bowling, yeah. And, and how many that, friends do, do you still have from the team? How many what, sorry? How many friends do you still have from the team? From the team? Um, I, I was a lot closer, I think, when I first started with the guys that I played with. Um, that, and then near the end. Uh, I was very lucky, I, I got in the state squad in, I think, 88 or 89. Um, and so I was lucky enough to see the changes of sort of old school to people pretending, thinking they're part of the furniture with a lot of the younger guys. Uh, I'm still good friends with a few of the guys I played with at the end, but more the, the Alan Borders and uh, the Mark Wars, um, those type of guys, Darren Lehman. Um, I'm good, good friends with all those guys from the team. And I think, no matter who you played with, you, start, you have a special sort of relationship with guys that you, you played with and travelled with. When you live in each other's pockets for nine months of the year, you can get on each other's nerves a bit. So, you know, a, whenever you catch up, it's always nice to... You have that bond, I think, in, uh, when you play sport. And that's what's beautiful about a team sport. You, you know, you're just enjoying other people's success, getting to know a lot of people. Team sport's the best 
thing for kids, um, whether it be netball, or cricket, football, rugby, whatever the sport is, if kids can get involved in sport early, I think it, um, it really does help you, it just helps you grow up, it helps you understand how things work and I think there's a lot of advantages for a team sport. So the bit you say that there are some parts of you that, that people would really love, like what? Well, come on, why don't you try and tell me if there's one or two? What, what, what do you think they're good about me? You know me well enough. What do you think there is? No, I don't think I do. And I'm here, I'm here to ask you the questions, not give you the answers. Um, I'm loyal. Uh, I'm a very good parent. Um, I think well, all of us make mistakes through life, and that's what sort of shapes who we are. Um, I, don't think, I don't live with any regrets, um, I don't think, because I don't think you can change that. No matter what happened yesterday, what happened 10 years ago, what happened 20 years ago, um, I was, I think I was 21 or 22 when I started playing cricket for Australia. Um, I had no idea really about the big bad world out there. I learned the hard way in a lot of things. Um, but I, I think some of the, the things that I've been brought up with, whether it be manners, like simple things like manners are free, saying please and thank you. Um, I've tried to instill that into my children. I always thought cricket to me was a hobby. It was something, it was a, something I loved doing and I was passionate about my job was to try and be the best parent I could. Now, I mightn't have been the best husband at times, um, but as far as a parent goes, you know, I've instilled some great values into my children. Um, we've got a great relationship. Um, they're my number one priority, no matter what. Um, so I think that's one of my proudest things, that um, you know, being, I'm, a, I'm a very good father, and I love being a father. Uh, it's, thank you. It's, um, I think all of us as parents, it's, it's bloody hard work. It's not easy. Um, being a parent, especially a mother, um, a mum, being a mum with all the issues that the kids have. Um, my kids now are turning 21, 19, 17. So when they're little, it's okay, there's little problems, but when they get bigger, you sort of have bigger problems. Um, but I love being a parent. It's always, it's tricky, it's not easy, but um, helping shape your children, they're a product of their environment. And if you can instill those good values with your kids, um, then hopefully that holds you in good stead. And so, so that's one of my better traits. Yeah, basically. yeah, and, and I'd agree with all of that. Thank well you. done. Well Thank done. Thank you. So you talk about uh, some of the other sides, you know, the other times that you've had or experiences you've had or, or the ramifications um, that have come from what you've done. And that is obviously the side that people would not want to be in. But can you explain what it's like when, when things get like that? When, when you plaster it all over, not the back page, but all over the front page... I mean, does it feel like I don't want to get up this morning and walk out the door because I don't want it to happen again? What is it? How, how do you cope with that? Uh, well, first of all, it's difficult. Um, you know, unfortunately, through my life, I haven't thought about the consequences sometimes. I just sounds good at the time and you just do it. And then you go, shit, the next day, what the hell happened? <laughs> um, I've never done drugs, so it's nothing like that. I've never touched drugs in my life, but sometimes the alcohol would make some bad decisions. Um, living that is very difficult. Um, you know, it's very hard to face it. I think the only way you can be, and I think why, some, why most people still like me, is I've always been honest. You know, I've taken responsibility for my actions, and if I've always come out and said, you know, I'm sorry, um, I'll try and learn by it, and most of the times I have. But, um, you know, it's only, I think it being real, being honest, I think is really important, even if you do make mistakes and stuff up. I think there's too many people that try and cover things up and try and if you keep lying about things, it just gets worse and worse. And then people start to rewrite history. Um, I think if you're honest, own it, take responsibility for your actions. Um, I think people can understand that you make mistakes, but they respect that. And that's that thing about respect versus liked. I, I, you know, I, I think being respected is so much more important than being liked. And that's some of the things you tell young kids in the teams these days playing sport. You know, it's all great to be Mr. Popular, but the only way you earn respect in that group is the way you conduct yourself, um, how you put yourself out for others, can you pass on your knowledge to people, are you genuinely happy for other people in your team, um, and all those things. And I think anyone that I played with, or any team I played with, um, I think I've earned that respect. And I think if you hear people speak about, you know, what was it like to play with Shane Warne, most people would say it was, it was great, he helped me, inspired me, those types of things. So. Yeah, look, it's difficult at times, as I said, but if you're honest and own it, then um, you can't do much more than that. I think it's... Yeah. 
I think it's fascinating when you talk about respect and um, playing the game and, and giving respect, showing respect and earning that respect. Um, again, the same word that we heard from Zach yeah. and, and Phil and Cindy. But have you ever thought about what sort of person you would be or what you would have done if cricket hadn't have found you? Well, I was delivering beds for 40 winks uh, in blue shorts and <laughs> boots and driving trucks. So I probably would still be doing that. Um, I, look, I, look, I was very, very lucky. I was very, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to play cricket for Australia. Uh, I played in a wonderful era of Australian cricket and with some great players. Um, and we had a lot of fun. And I think people say to you, what do you miss? Do you miss playing? I, I, I think if you ask most cricketers that played for a long period of time, it's not so much you miss playing. Um, you miss the competing and that's pretty hard to replace. Um, but you miss the camaraderie, the silly stuff that goes on in a dressing room, the fun times or, you know, just sitting around talking and, you know, I remember many nights here at the Sydney Cricket Ground sitting in the dressing room and talking with the guys and just not leaving the change rooms till two, three in the morning. Um, you make friendships that last a long period of time and, and as I said before, whenever you catch up with guys that you've played with, um, there's this little bond and it, it, just, it just makes you smile. And I look back at my career and go, we achieved some wonderful things. You know, we won World Cups, we won Ashes Series, we beat every team home and away. And along the way, I had a fair bit of success as well. So that's more than I ever thought would happen. You know, as a guy that was wanted to play AFL, AFL football, um, making, you know, signet rings in a factory at a jewellery shop, driving trucks for 40 winks, um, it ended up okay. You know, I was... Um, so, as I said, I, I'm very, very grateful for my lot. What would have happened... As I said before, I don't really think about the past. You know, someone asked me before, uh, are you disappointed you never captained Australia? I'm not, I was lucky enough to play under some terrific captains for Australia. Well, my first ever captain, Alan Border, was one, like he, what he instilled into me and I think a lot of their players through that late 80s and early 90s period um, went on to become pretty good players for Australia. Um, so he was great. But I think the best captain I played under was uh, Mark Taylor. I thought Mark Taylor's communication that he had between himself and the players, um, he, he made you take responsibility, he let you sort of set your fields. Um, I, I just thought he played the game in a way that was always trying to win. There's a lot of times, um, you know, he'd always take that aggressive option and bat first, he would declare, wouldn't set these big four, five hundreds um, targets. Um, he, he, he was always trying to win and I think what people sometimes misunderstand is that by setting those big targets where you can't really lose, you're not actually teaching your team how to win. And when, you, when the game's in the balance, that's how you learn to, how to win. Whether you're defending a target, you're trying to knock a team over, or you have to chase a target, the more times you get in those situations, the more times you'll, in the end, win. But you've got to learn how to win. Some teams, they don't learn how to win because the captain sets 500 in 100 overs and you know you're not going to lose. And how often do we see teams seven, eight down, eight down, nine down, oh, if we had to declare it earlier. So I think Mark Taylor always challenged us in that way, which made us better cricketers because we learned how to win. And then whenever we got in a situation where the game was in the balance, we would crush the opposition because we would just go out there and win and blow them away. So I think his communication with his attacking brand of cricket, he read the game well, he understood his players, so I think for him, it was, um, it was great to play under Mark Taylor. We know that cricket holds such a special place in, in the culture of Australia. How do you think the current team got into its current predicament? And, and where do you see the future of the game? Where, where do you see the strengths and, and probably some of the issues that need to be ironed out? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, I think, you know, most of us in this room, I would say, would love test cricket. You now, I, I believe test cricket is the hardest form of the game uh, at the moment. And, well, it always is and always will be because it's a real test. Five days, the best side will always win. 2020, one day cricket, necessarily the best side won't always win. Doesn't mean it's less entertaining or it's great fun. And I think we need those forms of the game for the game of cricket. But test cricket is the ultimate. And for me, I'd go a little bit radical with Test Cricket because I want it to stay here forever. And I think if we had our head in the sand about Test Cricket, about where it's going to be, I think we're, it's going to go. It'll just disappear slowly and it'll be, that'll be a real... That'll be so disappointing for Test Cricket to disappear. 
in the days of society, everyone's busy, everyone's got places to be, everyone's rushing around. So that fast food sort of 2020 stuff, which is great fun and entertaining, um, it, it, it comes and goes. Where test cricket, that, that proper meal that you want, the drama and everything that a test, test match has, we all love. So what do we do to keep it? One, I reckon we should be marketing it properly. I don't think we market it well enough and I don't think people understand what's involved in test cricket. So I'd be getting the best players in the world to say this is the reasons why I love test cricket and do some big campaign, push test cricket huge across the world. And the other thing I would do is I'd actually make entrance free to test cricket. I, I don't think you should charge for test cricket because I think test cricket is a TV sport I think we're getting these huge numbers of over a billion dollars for TV rights. And I understand that money through the gate makes a, a fair bit of money. But if you work it out, it's about a million bucks a day for test cricket. So over the course of a summer, it's somewhere around 35, 40 million dollars, which is a hell of a lot of money. But with the TV rights over a billion dollars into the whole significant scheme of things when you throw in sponsors and everything else and the money that test cricket makes, there's over a million people watching it on TV every day. So it is a TV sport, but you still want to turn the TV on and see people at the ground. So for me, I would say that people out there, dollars are tight for people. Um, it, it costs a lot of money to go to sporting events. I think if we want test cricket to survive, we market it properly, we make it free entry, we're making the money elsewhere, and that way when we turn the TV on, there's a lot of kids, there's a lot of people there, and they get to understand and love the game of test cricket. And I think that'll help it survive for a long period of time. <laughs> Another thing that we want to see, no matter what form of the game, we want to see a contest um, between bat and ball. Um, I think the concern, you asked me about the concerns, I think the pitches uh, that the guys play on is a concern as well. Um, you know, these days when we watch, why is the Adelaide Test Match the most popular Test Match through the summer? Under lights, it's not just because it's under lights, because the ball does something. It swings around, it nips around, and it's hard work, so batsmen's techniques get exposed if they're not good enough. So, I, you know, I, nothing's really happened to the ball for a long period of time. Why can't we weight one side of the ball or do something with the ball? You look at all the other sports in golf, the ball goes further. In all these different sports, the technology is there, but our cricket ball stays the same. Why can't we? Remember the tape tennis ball we used to play in the, down the driveway and it swung and it was really hard? Why can't we weight one side of the ball that it means it swings all day? Could weight one side of the ball means there'd always be a contest between bat and ball. Mm, that you're here, Shane. No, but that role me. with the IPL yep. and um, being involved in a team in that capacity, because I know it doesn't matter where you go around the world and you do commentary for many broadcasters around the world, what people love about it is the passion that you bring to the commentary. It was the same passion you had when you played. What about coaching? Is it, mm. is it as easy to instill that sort of passion in a team and get results, see that you're making a difference? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, the coaching side of things. I, I, I think, you know, with junior coaches, when I think coaching, I think, um, you know, my, when my boy was little about getting your front arm up and your front elbow up and those types of things. I think when, you, when you're around a, an international team or something like the IPL, the team, my role was team mentor, was actually helping the guys um, more or less think about the game, strategy, mindset, that sort of stuff. Because I think when you get to that level or international level, there's nothing wrong with your techniques. You haven't got there if you weren't any good. So sometimes people forget just that they are actually a good player. And it becomes about the way you think about the game, the attitude that you have. And when you do have a few failures, whether it be with the bat or the ball, people start to get negative. And that's when they start to get too technical, in my opinion. You know, if a bowler's not bowling well, suddenly you have a bowling coach talking about the front arm and you're talking about your follow-through and all this sort of rubbish. They forget about how they're trying to get the batsman out. As a bowler, all you need to think about is how am I getting the batsman out? And then naturally, you'll bowl the ball wherever it needs to be. Um, Batting-wise, you know, it's pretty simple. If you have that intent and you're busy and watch the ball, it's as simple as that, then you're gonna go okay. So it's all about, I believe, at top level sport, even in business, it's all about the way you think. And um, for me, my roles in the teams that I've had, I've always talked, try to teach the guys about the way they think and bring an energy to the group and an energy to the players um, that try to make them 
just make them believe, you know, ha help them try and believe. And um, it's hard sometimes when you're not playing because you sometimes want to like to grab the ball and try and say, rightio guys, come on, let's do this. But you can't do that, so you've got to try and um, instill some sort of belief into them. And, and I think what, one of the beauties of the IPL is some of the people you interact with. You know, you have four or five different cultures, different approaches to the game. Uh, and mixing with those people and talking about it, you learn a lot of stuff too. I just want you to finish with um, maybe sharing with us, we know about your exploits in cricket, but mm -hmm. for all the experiences you've had, as you say, travelling around the world, meeting different people from all different sorts of walks of life, are there, are there three people or, or three moments that stand out as something that really helped you see the world differently? Um... Good question, Tracy. I have it. Uh, three people. I think a couple of my favourite moments in my life so far, outside of my children, because they're the best. But so in my sporting career, I think the first, my biggest, my favourite moment in cricket was the day I walked out here in the Sydney Cricket Ground, uh, 1990, 91, or 91, 92. Bloody long time ago. Uh, and I walked out of the dressing room and I looked up on the scoreboard and said, "Congratulations, Shane Warne. You're the 350th Test cricketer to play for Australia." And that was. Um, to, th to think that you only had 350 people have ever played the game for Australia was pretty, um, pretty amazing. So that was probably a cricket thing. Um, geez, I've been lucky enough to meet some really interesting people through the game of cricket. Um, one of the most interesting people I've met that's become, over 20 years, one of my best friends was a guy called Chris Martin, who's a lead singer at Coldplay. Um, we met in a lift um, and we sort of said, are you... And he went, and we, ended up, we went upstairs and hit it off straight away. And we've been mates for 20 years when he first started. Um, so that world introduced me to a lot of different people in that world. Um, you know, meeting all sorts of musicians and different people with him. So I bet, look, I've been very, very lucky to meet uh, uh, so many different interesting people. Bob Hawke. Um, my mum had a cleaning business and was friends with Hazel Hawke. And when my brother and I, I think he was five, I was seven. We used to clean Bob Hawke's house. Um, and with my mum's cleaning business, so I got to know Bob Hawke 40 odd years ago. Um, he's a pretty cool guy and I thought was a wonderful prime minister too. So um, to clean the prime minister's house was pretty cool. All these, all these beers and stubbies that used to be all over the floor. And watching him here in the Sydney cricket ground, skull beers down in the corner with all the Richies over there um, was pretty amazing. But yeah, look, I, I'm, as I said before, I'm very, very grateful and thankful for the life I've had so far. Um, I'm very lucky to have three healthy children. Uh, I'm very happy with my life. I'm happy. And, um, you know, I, I long live the, you know, I'm looking forward to what the future holds. Hopefully I can win the World Series of Poker in Vegas in July. <laughs> <laughs> Shane Warne. One thing we do have to thank you for, not just for being here tonight and being so giving of your time, but also through all of it, through thick and thin, through your career, off-field exploits as well, you have always kept it real. Thank you for being Shane Warne. Thank you for being so honest. Thanks, Tracy, and thank you very much for having me too. Thank you.